Hello, and welcome to Coffee with Delzy, a 60-minute conversation delivering insights and practices from industry experts, and most importantly, your peers from around the country to help bring the espresso to your practice. I'm your host, Matt Delzingaro, or Delzy for short. I'm so excited to bring my next guest to the show. And keeping with our theme of 2022 and make it your best year ever, I have asked founder and CEO of the Efficient Advisor, Livy Grywe, to join me today. Welcome to the show, Livy, and it's great to have you on. Yeah, I'm super excited. I love that we're coming in hot here at the last quarter of the year, and we're going to help people finish strong. Well, Libby, what's most exciting to me about you is that you, you've, you're not just a coach, right? You're just, who's never done it before. You've actually walked the walk, you talk the talk, and you've done it in practice. And now you're trying to coach other advisors to do the same. And that's what's most impressive to me is that a lot of these coaches are just, you can't do, you coach, right? Or you teach. And you're doing both. So I, it's so impressive. So let me just give you a little background about Libby. Libby started in her own financial planning practice in 2004. She built a business all the way up to a seven-figure single advisor firm while working with only 25 hours, 25 hours a week. I, I know. I have no idea how she did it. She's not only was she running her own practice, she was raising two little kiddos. And while doing that, she was doting on her husband, which is with Justin, which is incredible. So she knows what it takes to be a hundred percent referral only practice and leaving the day-to-day grind of hours on end of working and how to be successful doing that only 25 hours a week. And I, I Libby, how the heck did you do that? That's essentially the conversation today. And there's no secret to the name of her company, The Efficient Advisor. If you take a look at her website, everything about that darn website is efficient. I went into your podcasts. I checked everything out. Everything is laid out so efficiently. You have your videos all in order. They're all in parts. And then... If that's not enough, you actually provided cheat sheets for every one of your sessions, which is incredible. So I can't wait to dive into to our interview today of how how you coach these advisors to be more efficient. Just the first question is the easiest one, right? Where did your mission to become so efficient come from and how did it change your own practice? Okay, that's fantastic. (laughs) I love this. So I'll take you back to 2008 and it was a crazy scary year. And it was funny. I was just speaking at a conference this last week. And when I mentioned 2008 and how scary it was, like all of the advisors like, yeah. And I was like, no, that has nothing to do with the market. It's because I was pregnant and I found out I was pregnant. So this was really great news because my husband and I wanted to have kids, but it was also really scary because for those first four years, the previous four years, I had been working around the clock, like a mad person, like any advisor starting their own practice, 80 hours a week, nights, weekends. I was there. I was your girl. And I'm sure that sounds familiar to a lot of people listening, like Friday at 6 PM. Sure. I'll be there Saturday morning at 10 AM. Sounds like a wonderful time for me. And so we found out that we were pregnant. And I just remember thinking like, there's no way I can be the mom that I really want to be and work like this. There has to be a better way. But I was also super happy with the amount of money that I was making and any like logical pregnant woman, because that's those things go hand in hand, right? Like totally normal, rational thinking and pregnancy all the time. I would just remember thinking it was so black or white. It was like, I either have to cut my hours in half and still make the money that I'm making, or I have to quit. It was like, those were like my two choices. So I just remember looking at my husband and I was exhausted and I was stressed. And I was like, I have got to cut the amount of hours that I'm working in half. And I know what I need to do. I really need to look at how I was spending my own time. I needed to really build out a team, but I really needed to create systems and processes. The bottom line. So you were doing all this, when you started, you were doing this all by yourself, have an assistant or did you have a power (laughs) plan or nothing? I mean, you were doing all your plans by yourself. Yes, I did at one point hire a, it's very generous to call her a, a staff person. She, I think she just played solitaire for 10 hours a week. I'm a hundred percent sure. That's, oh gosh. That's I thought you were going to give her more credit. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it was either Minesweeper or solitaire okay. for the they vast majority games. of her. I loved them. <laughs> loved Minesweeper. That was a personal favorite. Yeah, but it was really just me. And I knew I needed to, and I feel like this happens to a lot of advisors. And I was having this conversation with a bunch of people this weekend 
And it's like, you spend those first four years just trying to make it. And then you hit this point. And I feel like almost every advisor who's at least starting their own practice and not coming into a team that has lots of efficiencies and things built in, but every advisor kind of hits this point, maybe year three or year four, where they're like, okay, I'm making enough money. I know I'm going to be able to pay the mortgage. I'm not worried about where my next paycheck is going to come from. And this is the business I was wanting to build, but why am I so overwhelmed? Why am I feeling like the business is running me instead of me running it. And yeah. everyone hits that wall. Once they feel like secure from the financial side, they're like, okay, now I actually need to step back and create a business. Like so far, this is just a big old hot mess that's producing income. Right. No. So that's, you were working in the business. You weren't working on the business, right? That's the old saying. For sure. Yes. Yeah. They're top advisors. Do they really need our help in finding prospects and growing their practice and things like that? And what ultimately I've hear is that advisors don't care about getting prospects and referrals for the most part because they already have enough. And then what happens is they're like, man, if you could show me how to be more efficient on onboarding or processes or helping my assistant be more efficient with paperwork or blah, blah, blah. So I can see the need for you is tremendous in our industry. So what is the process? Like, how do we get these advisors to create their own systems and processes? if I had to boil it down, it was probably three things. It was first building a simple client service model. And you're going to hear the word simple a lot. So building a simple client service model and a client experience okay. that led our practice to being 100% referral only, right? Because when you get to be 100% referral only, you don't have to worry about marketing. You don't have to spend money on marketing. That's a whole right. other set of process, uh, headache things to do. The second would be building a simple team with the right people in the right roles in a way that's scalable and with the right vision and culture. Okay. And then third, it, it was really creating the simple time-saving techniques that the efficient advisor is really built around. And okay. it, what I see all of the time with advisors and I was there too, right? So I can say this because I was you is we make everything too freaking complicated. Yep. When we want to build something, we make it so hard <laughs> and there's too many steps and it's too complicated and we have a more is more mentality and yeah. then we'll never execute that consistently. So if it's hard or if it's complicated, I'm doing it once and then never, ever again. So it has to be simple. It has to be streamlined. And just because it's simple doesn't mean it's not good or that it's right. not super robust and adding a ton of value to your clients. So those were the three things it, for me. And when I found, when I made my business more efficient and more effective, it became more enjoyable. And that for me was really where it happened. So once I figured this out in just a couple years, I went from working 80 bazillion hours a week down to 25 hours a week. And I more than quadrupled the amount of income that I was making per hour. And we became a 100% referral only practice. So it's not, there was a time when I thought, oh, that's crazy that there's no way that you can do that. And you certainly can't do that quickly. And I thought those things couldn't coexist. I grew up in the industry when I started in 2004 with a pretty conservative broker dealer, I looked around and everybody around me was fat, bald and 50. So I call them the FBFs. And so I'm I was kind here. of this, you and me both just give me another day. Yeah. And I looked around and the mentality back then, and I say that now, cause I, I always like forget how old I actually am. So this was almost two decades ago, but the mentality was if you wanted to make more, you had to work more. And it was that hustle culture. And it was like, if you're mm. not grinding, you're not growing. And yeah. it was really just settling into the idea of rejecting that and knowing, okay, this is my business. I can do it however the heck I want to. And I think there's a better way. And I can look to other practices and other advisors within this industry, but I could also take a lot of notes and a lot of ideas and a lot of things out of businesses outside of the industry as well. So you, what you're telling me, and I'm hearing this as you speak, is that you're telling me that we have to have some sort of structure. Okay. Yes. Uh, and we're salespeople, <laughs> sister. <laughs> yes, I, <laughs> I know. know what me too. <laughs> I, that's, I think the ultimate problem with most of my advisors, I at least call one is that they, there's no structure. Like mm -hmm. it's the shoot, just giving each person like a title and what exactly their roles are in the practice itself. So how do you, how do you develop structures for essentially we're all salespeople in this business, right? We're for selling, sure. So financial advice, right? And what's worse is that it's not even tangible. It's intangible. So we're selling the intangible. So 
how do you create structure in an office that's already doing, let's say seven figures and, but they're working 80 hours a week. What do you do there? Yeah. And it happens all the time. So the first thing is like that, I always say the number one indicator of success, and there's a lot of research backing this. I went on a mission a few years ago and was reading everything that I could. What are the characteristics of successful entrepreneurs? What are the traits? What are the habits? What are all of the things? And the thing that kept popping up everywhere as the number one indicator of a successful business balance with life. So not just how much money are you making, but really entrepreneurs that report being wealthy and happy okay. self-awareness. So the first thing you have to have is just to be self-aware enough. And I think sometimes that's a little hard for us as advisors. Like I, I was coaching a team and I was talking to their director of operations and I was like, look, all advisors are crazy. You just have to figure out which kind of crazy your advisors are. And then we have to work around that. Right. So the self-awareness that we're all, there's a little bit of ego, there's a little bit of rejection. So for me, when I started my business, I was 22 and I was the smartest 22 year old on the planet, of course. And Absolutely. I knew oh, this is the greatest thing. I can sleep till noon and I can work till midnight. And I don't need structure because I'm an entrepreneur and I get to do whatever <laughs> I want and whenever I want. And it wasn't until having children that I realized, oh, the only thing that's actually going to give me freedom in life is to have some structure. Yeah. Structure is actually what provided me freedom. Yeah. And I think for advisors, we're just so busy and it's not our fault. We, there's so much to learn. You're so busy being in this. Like I always describe it as like a tornado, right? You're in this tornado where you're doing everything. You're, you're learning the business, you're learning paperwork, you're learning how to deliver advice. You're learning taxes. You're learning about estate planning. You're, you are just constantly learning and there's no time. And we're not, people in our lives aren't intentional enough to be like, you actually also have to carve out time to be a business owner too, and to learn how to be a leader and learn how to be a CEO and how to think strategically about your business. There's no time for that. We're just handling the stuff that's coming, coming at us every single day and needs to get done because everything feels urgent and everything feels timely. So really we're not taught how to create systems or we're not. And it's one of those, oh yeah, we need to do that. And everything lives up in our head. So we've, right. we've built it. And everything lives here and we can articulate it to a team member or to a staff member. And then we wonder why isn't it being executed the way that I want it to, or we're not even taking the time to come back and be like, Hey, how is that process working for you? Yeah. We think the way that we're doing it up in our noodle is the way that everybody's going to do it. And it's going to be successful every time. So we're honestly just really not taught how to do it. And there's just too much. There's too much. So it has to be really an advisor has to be ready. I can't step into a practice and be like, Hey, we're going to create systems and processes. Yeah. If the team's not feeling like, okay, I'm overwhelmed. Uh -huh. I have advisor ADD. I need to figure this out. The advisor has to have that self-awareness to be like, okay, I'm working too much. My business is running me. I need to do something. Right. And that the first thing that I always suggest that we do, we used to do these two day workshops where advisors from all over the country would come in and my team and I would train them on our systems and processes. And so we were building out the promotional materials for it. And I was like, okay, if we're going to do a webinar or we're going to talk about like, what is the one thing, if I could just share one life-changing thing with an advisor, what would it be? Like if I could take this whole two days and condense it down into one hour and it's really figuring out how to scale yourself and how to manage yourself first and foremost. And it's wow. not rocket science. It's really creating a model week, or I've heard it called an ideal week and creating some structure. So that's where you start most of the time, because I was just going to ask you if there, what are the biggest mistakes you see when you sit mm -hmm. down with a practice that's already successful? Yeah. Your latest interview was with actually a husband and wife where they did, where they tripled the revenue in three years, right? I mean, where, what were some of the things that you helped them implement? Or did you see like their shortcomings? Like, all right, this is easy. I know how to fix this one. Or is it hard for you when you sit down with a practice or do you see, it? is it like, Shining right in your face. Okay. This needs to be fixed. This person's doing the wrong thing, whatever. Yeah. It's easy for, as an outsider, right? So it's like, anytime, like a girlfriend comes to you advice for advice and you're like, okay, girl, you need to dump that guy. He's an idiot. Can't you see this? Everybody else yeah. can see this. Why can't you? <laughs> right. But when you're right. in it, you're like, he's so dreamy and he's really kind and he makes mistakes sometimes. It's so easy when you're on the outside looking in because you're not in that tornado. I'm not dealing with, okay, I need to get this out to the Joneses and I have to call so-and-so back and our culture feels really odd. Like 
I'm not dealing with any of that. So it's very easy for me to come in from a 10,000 foot level and go, okay, tell me about your process. Tell me about like, just, and I just have them start describing it to me. And I was like, and I start writing it down and I'm like, send it to me. Do you have this written down? And they're like, no, I'm like, it's always up in their head. So a lot of the times it's just, we just need to start by getting some of this down on paper right? and then figuring out what can we delete? What can we delegate? What can we automate and what do we actually have to still do? And then how do we make that better, faster, smarter, cheaper, easier? Smarter, faster, cheaper. How many times have you said that? (laughs) Only 5,000. Yeah, correct. Smarter, (laughs) faster, cheaper, easier. Smarter. That's pretty good. I like that. All right. So you said self-awareness. So I'm assuming that self-awareness means, okay, tell me about your day or here's an app. Here's, I've heard this before from coaches is I want you to now time your week. Uh huh. And time what you're doing. Are you sitting in front of the computer looking at emails from eight to nine every day? Or is that some of the exercises that you put someone through? And are they worth those exercises? Are those exercises it, worth the time? Yes. It, it's something I absolutely suggest people do because it's funny because I'll have an advisor say, so all I want to do is meet people. And that's the high value activity. And yes, that's what I'm doing. Absolutely. Go, that's what I hear. Yeah. And I'll go, awesome. How much time a week are you doing that? And they're like 10 hours. I'm like, okay. And then maybe there's a little prep and a little follow-up. Then what, what are you doing the other 35 hours of the week? Yeah. And my friend, Matt Jarvis calls it playing office. Like I'm in there, I'm playing office. And <laughs> when you start tracking it, you actually start to recognize. I just spent 45 minutes looking at comments on my YouTube videos and looking at measurements and statistics. Is that something that really should take me 45 minutes? Can I have somebody else go through the comments and look for questions or topics for new videos? Also, my office can measure the success of our social media that tracking it's, is that, a, is that something that's necessary? Is that an ego thing? Like, why do I like doing it? It's probably because, an ego thing, but yeah. 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 Or it's just, that's something that I'm doing that feels effective and entertaining, but that's not the ap- absolute best use of my time. Okay. And so those exercises, as annoying as they are, and I always laugh because when we start coaching, I'm like, okay, there's gonna be a lot of what I call eye roll work where it's like, everyone's like, oh, oh, I don't want to talk about any of, we all hate that part because it's not fun. And if it were fun, everybody would have it done and be like, yes, let me, let me absolutely look at how I'm spending every second of my day because that's a great time. Nobody does it because it's not fun. Well, it's not no one wants to expose themselves. That's yeah. I think it's probably the biggest issue is I don't want to admit that I'm looking at emails or looking at, I'm a big chartist with, with the stock market. That's one of my favorite mm-hmm. hobby of mine. And sometimes I catch myself I'm like, what am I doing? I should be on the phone. So I, no one wants to expose themselves or their sinful acts, if you will. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And everybody thinks the solution is hiring more staff. And it's, that's, you have to scale yourself before mm-hmm. you can add anybody else. Like you have to absolutely be able to manage your own time. And for me, like some people will look at the schedule that I had, like I'll, I'll go through and go, here's how I did it. And they'll go, that feels very regimented or, oh my gosh, how did you do that? And I go, don't forget, I only had to do it three days a week. I only had to do it 114 days a year. I, I could do it because it gave me the freedom on my off days to not have to play office, to not have to worry about my office, to truly disconnect and unplug. If I didn't have that structure, I wouldn't have that freedom. That's amazing. So there, I guess there's the key right there. Are you willing to put in the work? Like, so what I am, this is a little off topic, but when is it time to hire somebody to the staff, add somebody new? Because it, I get that all the time. Hey, send me any resumes you get, send me any candidates mm-hmm. you think that, or somebody who's unhappy at one office. Yeah. Back. So I'm caught con- because we're the middleman, right? We see right. everybody. So advisors, like I call myself the priest because they tell us things that they don't tell anyone else. Profession right? time. Yes. <laughs> time. So I'm sure coaches, as the coach, you get the same thing. So when should someone consider a new staff member? When they've looked at themselves and they're like, I am literally using every minute of my day super effectively and I can't get it all done. And they have to have a really good understanding of, because I think sometimes we do this, we try to find a great person and then we like build a role around that person. We actually really need to have it. It's the opposite. We need to have a really good understanding of what role does our practice need? And then we have to go find the right person to fill that role. Cause sometimes we Uh hire somebody and we're like, oh, they're not really great at that. So I'll keep doing that. And when that's actually the thing that we can scale and it's because we don't have the right person in the right role, we have the right, or we have a great person, but we don't have a, we're building the role around them versus building the role around what our practice 
actually needs. So for me, it's going through like having a documented planning process and going through and figuring out which part of these are templatable and delegatable. And so we actually have a little plot chart and it's like something as simple as the first thing that I do is I send out a follow-up email after they book an appointment, giving them details. Can you template that? Can you delegate that? Okay. That's a highly easy one to give away. And, and then we start circling, which ones do we enjoy doing? Which ones we do we not enjoy doing? So it's the highly delegatable, the highly templatable things that we don't enjoy doing. That's how we build out our role and then find the right person to fill that. And then as our practice expands and as we're continuing to scale ourselves, and we're going, okay, I'm feeling that pressure and that pinch again. And now my staff person's starting, they're scaling themselves. They're feeling that pressure. They're feeling that pinch. Now we can go back and look at this exercise and say, okay, what are the next things that I can start to delegate? I can start to template and I can start to teach somebody else don't enjoy, or they're super scalable. So even though I do enjoy it, that's something I can start to give away. Like how I won't long does miss this that. take? Like how long does this take to do this? Like the exercise itself? Yeah. Like and to the point of like, all right, I think I'm, I got my efficiency down. I got the structure of my day. How long does it take for your clients to, to figure that out? Like, all right, I think I got my day and my time blocking and my week laid out. Yeah. All right. the, ti- the time blocking into week, it's usually, so when we coach, we try to set a cadence, whether it's every two weeks or once a month or every three weeks. And it's usually, um, unfortunately it doesn't take long for people to go, Oh yeah. Okay. Look at me. I'm wasting like tons and tons of time. I just spent 30 minutes on Instagram Yeah. and now I'm cause most people like I always say your parents didn't raise a quitter, but they did raise a procrastinator. And most of us need deadlines yeah. and timelines. So we have to figure out like, what are the productivity things that will work for us? The hard part is once you figure it out, you're still going to need lots of iterations. Cause once you're aware, then you're going to go, you know what else I really need in my week? I don't have enough time for a personal development. And there's no white space. I need a little margin. And you're going to go through, I swear my model week, I probably had a hundred iterations of it. Cause as soon as the thing about a practice too, is every time you hit a new level, there's new devils and the systems and processes that you built, you almost have to come in and break it and rebuild it every time you hit a certain level. And the good news is you don't have to break it entirely because you have this foundation, you have this system, and now it's just enhancing what you've already built and created, but the work of a CEO is never done. It's never like a company goes out and hires like general mills isn't okay. We want to produce some Cheerios. Let's get a guy in here. We'll get the Cheerios made. And then we're going to get rid of him. Always going to have to be recasting a vision, figuring out ways to make it better, smarter, faster, cheaper, easier, always going to have to be stepping into that CEO role. And that's where things really change for an advisor is when they realize, okay, I need to be delivering advice. I love that. I'm a financial advisor and I need to run this business like a CEO. And I need to dedicate time on my calendar to working on the business and to really stepping into that ownership of, okay, I have to lead these people. Like I can't just hire and let it ride. Like I have to have structure or I have to have systems and processes to be able to give more away, to delegate properly for this to run without me. And I always suggest people start working up to taking a month off in their practice. So that when you do that experiment, you figure out what's broken, what absolutely requires your attention and what are the things that you need to be able to create some structure around so that you can truly unplug. And not that everybody wants to take a month off, but it's a really, it's a really interesting exercise that a lot of major corporations do where they have a person take a sabbatical and they say, okay, what's all of the stuff that we can't do? How do we function without this person? And it helps them realize what's broken. That's pretty cool. So that's an exercise you you almost require when you take on a new client. No, I don't necessarily require it. It, it, It's everybody is eye opening. I will say that it's huge. I, we were, when I was an advisor, we were working with a pretty large endowment here in the area and the original founder CEO, we went in to do some paperwork changes to make some adjustments inside of the account for them. And I remember we sat down and they're like, Oh, she's not here. We can't do this. Like, this is something we actually need her signature on. And we're like, that's fine. No problem. When will they be, when will she be back? And they're like in three months. And I'm like, what? And they were telling us, they're like, yeah, this is something that our board is requiring. We asked her to go to Europe for three months. And what are, what we're doing is figuring out what protocols do we need to have in place? If she's not around, if she's not available. And as an advisor who sold her practice, 
to be able to, when you're marketing your practice or you're selling your practice, if that's a, an exit strategy, right. the more your business can run without you, the more valuable your business is. So to be able to know, okay, how do I empower my team to handle this and this while I'm gone? What needs to happen? Who needs to be licensed? How do we need to make some adjustments inside of the office to make sure that people have the right signing abilities or that, how do we like at these problems crop up. So I started taking a week off like a normal week, but completely unplugged. I won't check my email. And I found that my team would just, because it was only like seven days, they'd just let it ride. And when I got back to the office next week, I could handle it. (laughs) And then I went for two weeks and it was like, okay, there's some things that we can wait for Libby to return. And we'll just leave it on her plate for when she comes back. And okay, there's a few more things that we need to be able to handle. And then I went for three weeks and then I went for four weeks. And each time It was an intentional experiment to see, okay, she's not coming back next week. So we need to figure out as a team, how to handle this so that the next time this happens, we don't have to call her and be like, Hey, I know you're in Italy, but if you could find like a, we need you to figure out how to print this and sign it and send it back for this client. Now we know, okay, who do I need to empower to do what do we need to have some written procedures or protocols on how to handle X, Y, and Z if I were unavailable. Wow. So This is so cool because what you're doing is you're basically uncovering the sins, if you will, (laughs) of what's going on when everything's not working at its, when not everyone's there, all the players are on the field. It's like a team football team. When they're a star quarterback or running backs out, you could see the inefficiency and expose where they're exposed, right? Because they, they're weaker parts. So that exercise is allowing them to, uh, to do that. Hey, you're the quarterback of everything, right? As the owner and the entrepreneur, now let's see how this thing works without me. So that's pretty cool. And it's, it's really, before we, it's yeah. coming from the client perspective, like everything we do has to be like, okay, I, my mission was to never have to say no to a client. No, we can't do that for you. No, that has to wait. Nope. We can't. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. Libby's not here. We can't execute that for you. So I think if we're really putting the client and the client experience at the center of everything that we're doing and recognizing that. So for me, it wasn't just about, oh, Libby wants to take more time off. I'm not going to lie. I totally did. But at the same time, it was like, how do we make sure that the experience for our clients isn't dependent on me? How do we make sure that the experience for them is going to be smooth, whether I'm in Cincinnati or I'm in Italy or whether I'm in the office or I'm out of the office, how do we make sure that somebody can handle their request and somebody can execute whatever for them quickly and in a timely and efficient manner? No, I love it. So this word experience, right? Client experience, like mm-hmm. a, the hot button. And whenever we, like the industry talks about it, it's the first thing I think of is because it's been ingrained into me from all these different coaches that we have speak. What do you think it is? <laughs> it's that when they come in, you already have their personalized drink for them. <laughs> and and it's like, yeah, it's is that. that what the experience we're talking sure. about? Mm-hmm. What is client experience? mean to your, to the efficient advisor? What is that? Yeah, it's kind of one of those terms lately. It's, it's just yeah. kind of overused, kind of gaslighting, uh, right? Everybody's gaslighting these yes. days. Uh, or value add. Uh. Yeah, value add. Yes. Value add is another one. That's just, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> For me, client experience is two things. There's the business to consumer component and there's the human to human component. Okay. So there is, we do live in an experience economy and there's a couple of amazing books that I would highly recommend about this. We live in an experience economy where people are sharing their positive experiences places. There's that, is it Instagrammable, right? So there okay. is that, oh yeah, sure. I want to have like razzle dazzly things, but at the end of the day, the number one, the absolute best form of marketing is doing a good job like doing what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it and actually executing on it. It does not matter if you remember that I want a vanilla latte with cinnamon foam, (laughs) non-fat, gluten-free, like free, whatever. It does not matter if you drop the ball on my business. (laughs) I'm telling you, they, they get so focused on this. When I walk into the office and I ask, Hey, tell me a little bit about your practice and your client experience. And they all go to the same thing. Oh, we know their drink when they come in, the favorite. Yeah. And that's good. That's yes. part of that human to human piece. Yes. It's part of like your clients feeling like, Hey, I'm more than an account number. And right. that, that this is, but you have to be as, as, as much as maybe it's overused, you have to be adding significant value to them. You have to have a strategy 
of adding value. If a client's coming in and they're leaving the meeting thinking, why the heck was I there today? That was such a waste of time. Everything that they told me I could have looked up online. I know my own rates of return. I can look that up on, on fidelity.com. If we're not adding, if we're not strategically educating, adding value, doing deep dives into different realms of financial planning with them, it doesn't matter if they've got my latte there or not. So, okay. So we talk about more of the bigger picture, like the mm-hmm. experience, the process, right? Helping clients call their 401k provider and when to call and how, what's that like being on the phone with them rather than going to the exit interview, things like that. In Pennsylvania, our, uh, the teachers and our, uh, the education or educators are their pension and there's a lot of decisions to make. So the advisors, one of the experiences they provide is going to the exit pro- or even going to the seminar that they have to listen to. They're sitting there shoulder to shoulder, as my wife calls it, and listening and helping them walk through. So it's not as scary, right? That's the experience. So what is it when, what do you talk about in terms of the process of like, you know, there's six things, the financial, right? We sit down and we evaluate and then we do mm-hmm. your portfolio and your estate and all that good stuff. Is that a part of your process is, or is that more just, Hey, that's the advisors. That's how they do their own planning. Yes. So I have for, In your hands, that I should say is the question. Right, right. For us, I would say I have our systems to scale, which is there's six layers of building. Okay, a I was just actually going to ask you yes. that. Okay. And in one of those layers, it's creating and creating your planning process and creating your client experience. And a piece of that is exactly what you're saying. Like figuring out what are the theme, like we called them, everyone calls them value ads. We've been calling them themes for year, but for years, but it's, what are you going to do in year one for your client? What are you going to do in year two for your client? What are you going to do in year three for your client? How are you going to just have a strategy of here's how I'm going to deliver high quality, deep financial planning to clients over the next one. So every year having a strategy and then the strategy is not, oh, we'll just update their financial plan and review their investment portfolio. It needs to be more than that. It needs to be uh, to create a client experience. It needs to be deeper. So it's a combination of the two, right? There's, and that's why I say there's two pieces to it. There's the business to client or the business to consumer piece, which is that, yes, I have to get the paperwork done. Yes. We don't want to make trade errors. Yes. Like we need to follow through on the things that we're going to say that we're going to do. There's absolutely that. And we need to have a process that we're following for our planning and we need to be taking this relationship to the next level. We need to be educating them. We need to be caring about them at a level that they've never experienced before. We need to be customizing the experience to the client. And it's really both. And part of that human to human experience is being strategic and organized so that you can add value, right? Massive value, deep value, whatever the phrase is out there, you need to be able to add value to clients. And it needs to be done in a way that's that human to human connection. In addition to the business to consumer, it really has to have both pieces. All right. That I love this because this is where you talk about systems to scale, right? The six levels. Does it differ for ages? Because you got clients who are 50 that you might start working with as a client, you're not going to get to like they're 60, right? It just, you know. so is there a different system? Because I have to assume at 50, you're probably not worried about Medicare and social right. yet. Was the phases, are they, what's the word? Expedited, if you will, if they're 60 or 62, because they're so close to choosing social security and Medicare and things like that. Does that differ? For, for yeah. yeah. So in my perfect world, every advisor would have a really clearly defined niche that they serve. Okay. Uh, but in the real world, we know that's not always humanly possible. Right. So if let's say you specialize, you specialized in federal employees All right. and everybody in your book was a federal employee, you're going to have a similar thing that you can talk to about them, but even then you're going to have to differentiate. So can you have themes each year. And then within those themes, like some of the different quarterly themes or value ads be slightly modified. So I'm going to maybe this quarter, talk about five to nines to people with children, but I'm not going to talk about five to nines to people who don't have children. That's what I mean. That's so obvious, but that's, that's exactly what I'm alluding to. But there's some things that are universal, right? So if you're going to say Q2, we're going to do a deep dive on everybody's tax return, and we're going to be looking for tax gaps. It doesn't matter if they're a young family with HSAs and they're doing this and they're contributing to five, or if they're self-employed business owners, if we're looking for tax gaps, we're looking for tax gaps. Um, so, but again, that's why you have to have the structure to do that. So 
let's say that we're doing that in Q2 and Q4, we're doing, let's say employee benefits package updates for our retirees. Maybe we focus on RMD planning or qualified charitable distribution, or so you can have two different like categories of themes. Again, if you're organized and you're ready to do it and your team knows what the marching orders and who's doing what for who, when it's not ter- it sounds complicated, but it's really not. And it's funny. Cause when we actually, when we're coaching and we start sketching out and we give them our themes chart, it's just like, it's ghetto looking and it's not really like, this is going to be the thing that organizes my practice. Like these four little boxes, are you for real? And, and that's again, where it comes like this complexity, right? Like our brain naturally goes to, we're going to have to have this one and this one. And what about this one? And you really don't, you can build your themes based on who's in your practice, who you're serving, the planning that you love doing. You can build your themes to serve everybody. And then you just might customize or slightly modify within that. All right. So this is, I guess this is the question of the day because, or of the, of this interview, it, because you're talking about efficiency, you're talking about working less hours, right? Having more mm-hmm. fun and think, I mean, 25 hours, how many households mm-hmm. do you have? What is the magic number of how many times do you, the advisor, not your support staff, mm-hmm. advisor sits in front of their client? Okay. So this is, I went to school for engineering. So I originally went to college for, and and it's funny because most people, whenever I say this in front of a crowd, although I know I'm just as surprised as you are that I went to school for engineering physics. And so my brain (laughs) naturally just reverse engineers everything. And it's okay. But I was also that kid who uh, like in high school was like, what's the bare minimum that I have to do to get an A in here. I'm not doing anything extra. Like when I was studying for my series seven, it was like, I need a 70 great. I don't want a 71. I don't want a 75. I don't need an 89. I I literally just need to pass this thing. What do I need to do that? (laughs) So for me, it's figuring out. So the way that we did it, and this is a little backwards, but we would figure out, okay, how much do we as a practice make per hour? Or you could do how much as an advisor, do I want to be valued at per hour? So let's just say for simple math, it's $500 an hour. Okay. I have a client that I'm making $2,000 of revenue off of in a year. Realistically, I can afford to give them four hours of time. Okay. So you're backing then, into it. Backing into it. And so, okay. okay. How much prep goes into a meeting? How much follow-up goes into a meeting? How much kind of in between meetings are we doing? What are we doing for our value ads? So realistically, I could give them maybe two meetings a year. And then that, that would allot two hours for pre-meeting, post-meeting, in between meeting. Okay. So that's how we did it. So we structured our bands based on how much time could we afford to give those clients. So the more involved, the more personalized value ads or themes, we could do a whole lot more for our clients that we were making $10,000 a year off of. Then we could, we would do more of the one to many type value ads for the clients who we were maybe only making $2,000 off of. We segmented our book that way. And that worked really well for my brain and for my team's brain to say, okay, here's how much revenue we get off this client. Here's how much time we can afford to give them and still meet that number. And then the objective was for the revenue per hour to grow year over year. Wow. That's a very different answer than I'm, I hear from most coaches or experts or anything I've read is to back into that number. So what is, do we include this into that number? Cause what I've seen from the top offices, the multi multiple seven figure offices or practices, if you will, is they do three things. One, they touch their clients more often than the advisor who doesn't. I've seen studies where it's three times more, 18 times a year versus six. And that's right. statements, newsletters, right. not just talking or face-to-face. And the, all, the other thing was client appreciation events running like one or two, at least a year. And then the third thing, and I think is probably the biggest thing is the education. They were constantly doing something for the entire practice, something educating. So you use these themes, right? Mm-hmm. Planning, tax planning, benefit packages. Are this, would you consider all that into implementing into the practice to become more efficient? You're not going to say, mm-hmm. all right, each individual person that you're going to do an employee package update, you're going to educate them on why we're looking at this package, correct? Or, yes. or yeah. the importance of it. Is that a big thing when you're coaching these advisors to become more efficient? And that's really what the themes are, right? It's that combination of a touch, a education, a human to human connection, 
and being a really great planner. And how do we execute all of yes, that? Yes, that's efficiently. Like the question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so for me, we did deep, we did deeper themes in the first quarter of the year and the third quarter of the year. And the reason is, is January one, me and my team, we came out with all the new year, new you vibes, right? Like that. Right. Okay. This is the year we're going to get it all together. Like we were pumped up at the beginning of the year. So we right. did a big value add that was more time intensive. And then second quarter as a mom, when school year's wrapping up and you're getting into May, which is like all the recorder performances and the school play and the, the just so many year end athlete dinners, like oh, there's too much uh, in May. Yes, so right. Q2, we and did graduation a, on top of it, all of that. There's so much. And then summer. So we would do a really like much easier more low key value add in the second quarter. And okay. then the third quarter, when my kids were back at school and it was like, yes, mom has got some time again. Then we did again, a more involved, more time intensive value add. And then the last quarter of the year, when it's the holidays and it's all the things, the weather's not so great. It's everyone's a little sleepier end of the year. And you're just trying to get all of the stuff done for your clients, right? We're trying to get RMDs, make sure those are distributed. We're trying to get any year end planning done, like tax stuff. It's too busy. So we did a lesser value add or a more one to many value add in the fourth quarter. It's taking these themes and wrapping them around the cadence and the flow of your business and your lifestyle Okay. So that you're not like in Q4 trying to really lean into the holidays with your family and really enjoy some time off and doing a massive, like crazy value at. So it's coordinating all of those things. Interesting. I like that. That's a, that's a different way of looking at the year, especially my wife's a stay at home mom. So my priorities and things like that are going to be a little different than mm -hmm. you. When you were running your practice, you were a mom, you have two little ones. And I'm sure your husband was working as well. So it's everyone's practice is going to look a little differently and you just, you can custom it, customize it to essentially your lifestyle. I love that. That's yeah. awesome. Well, and the thing about this business is there's really what I love, love, love about financial planning. And what I love about coaching advisors is that it's so different. There's so many ways to be successful. There is no prescriptive. It has to look like this, right? Yeah. So for me, I was more concerned about increasing my revenue per hour, meaning was I becoming more effective and more efficient with my time versus, oh, I want the revenue of the practice to grow 20%. And then I didn't have a, any sort of management or monitoring of the amount of time that I was putting in. I wanted to make sure my time wasn't growing twice. So for me, it was like, well, what's important to you as an advisor? What does your life look like? What is like, why are you in this business? Like your why understanding your why story is critically important to, and that's actually one of those eye roll things that we do at the beginning I is know. defining like, why are you doing this? What's the purpose? Like, why are you here? And then how do we build a practice around your why yeah. and knowing that it can change too. Right. So someday my kids will be off to college and th then my life can look completely different. But until right. then I'm driving them to track practice. I'm going to be at the thing and I'm going to, and knowing what are the other advisors in your practice and how do we all get on the same cadence or do we? Yeah. All right. If someone's watching this, mm -hmm. right. And they're just like, all right, I just want a nugget. What is that nugget? Is it the why? Is it figuring out your, what do you want to be paid per hour? What is the thing that you would you start with these advisors when you sit down and you go, all right, we're going to make you as efficient as possible. Okay. Where do we start? Like, is there something that they can go to a website or anything like a value add I hate that word um, <laughs> that we can bring to these advisors that they, for taking the 60 minutes to watch this, what is yeah. something that they can walk away with? Um, I, I think for me, if there is no magic bullet, right? There isn't a magic bullet and it's going to be super different for everybody, but I think it's building in a little bit of white space. And actually uh, one of my favorite things to tell advisors is to like, and I, this is going to sound crazy, but leave your phone at the house. Don't bring a computer, take a, like this crazy contraption called a notepad <laughs> and a pen and not, I got a, one. not a remarkable, not your, I've had uh, yeah. the pen, <laughs> like I'm talking old fashioned paper and just figure out what do you want? What do you want? What do you want out of life? What do you want personally? What do you want professionally? What do you want for your children? What do you want for your spouse? What do you want? And that is the best place for us to start is how do we build a business that serves the life that you love? Cause having a business that you love does not matter if it's not serving a life that you love. 
because like you're so much more. And I think I, I went through that period where I was running my business and I was a mom and that was it. And I realized there's so much more to me. I, there's so many other facets of life that are critically important besides working and making money and taking care of my children. There's thing I have hobbies and activities and things that give me joy. And my husband had things that we wanted to do that gave him joy. And I think it's really, really important to know what is it that you're trying to accomplish with your life? And then how do we build a business that serves just that? See, I, God, you are mind blowing today because I've heard so many coaches. I've read so many books on running an efficient practice and things like that, but you've taken it to another level, if you will, where you're, it's funny. I watched it. I watch a lot of golf videos. Okay. And Great. <laughs> got the guy, this old school guy who uses the old clubs, the heavy, the wooden drivers. And I love him to death because he just looks at the golf differently. The mistake that the golf world has made is that we try to customize the club to the golfer. And, and it really, that's the mistake. It's the club that we should be customizing our swing to. And it's totally, it's a mind blowing thing. And some of the things you said today, like, we have to find the perfect employee, right? The best employee who's the most efficient or the, is great with people. And you're like, no, let's get the most efficient and the best role and build that role and then just plug and play, right? Because if everything's laid out in front of them and they can do the job, it's, it's going to build itself. So it's that you don't have to have that perfect employee. It's just, you have to have the perfect role. And that's, is, am I correct in hearing you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have to and, understand what is it that your business needs? Yeah. Same thing. What is it that your life needs? And then how do we build towards that versus, yeah, trying to fit life in around everything else it, or trying to fit like personal joy or faith or whatever it is for you. If we're not, not everyone talks about the rocks with the pebbles and the sand and it's, it, but it's true, right? We have yeah. there's <laughs> it's so really many good. of those, right? Yeah. But it's so true, right? It's a great visual of where are the rocks? And if the rocks are being super present with your family and then you're bringing your work home every single weekend and you're on your phone at soccer games and you're not being fully present with your family, but your business is thriving and super successful. Are you going to be living a life that you love? No, you're going to feel incongruent because that's not what you set out to do. I think for me, it, yeah. And maybe it's that reverse engineering, but it's really solving for what is the life that I want and what is the business that I want? And it's funny because not every advisor out there wants to 10 X their 10 X. Some people just want a two X and that's okay. And so I think we some put this, if you're not growing, you're dying, which, okay fine. But there's also this idea that there's a difference between contentment and complacency. You can right. still be content without being complacent. Like I still had massive business goals and I could also be content knowing that my life was being built the way, like that was what I was serving. Does that, I'm not sure. No, are we getting a little philosophical I, here? I at know the end? we are. I'm not I sure what's happening I love, here. We I took a hard it. right. <laughs> you think when you look at this, this interview, they're looking for secrets and what is that process? But it really, it all comes down to what is your why? That's, and I love Deirdre and she's crazy good talks. Has yes. answered that right? What is your why? And I guess you can't even start unless you know what your why is, right? What do you want? Because then everything can be built around that. How many clients do you want? How much do you want to make an hour? <laughs> How many hours do you want to make? So you literally back into it rather than just going full force. Okay, just give me the process. Give me the magic bullet. There is no magic bullet. It's, it's really what it's going to come down to. What do you want? Yeah. And it's funny. So it's literally both, right? Like I used to hate when I would go to a conference or like a big regional meeting and we'd have this amazing speaker and they would drop like all of these amazing, like business altering bombs, right? Yeah. And you'd be like, I'm going to do all of it. And then you'd go back to your office and you'd have that, like, we, we all do this, right? Where we're like, I'm going to clear a whole day to work on these things. And yeah. then you get to that day and there's too many other things to do a, so now your eight hours is only two. And then you sit down and you stare at that blank piece of paper and you're like, I don't know where to start. So I do believe you have to have both. So I'm a big fan of, if you're going to tell me about some stupid template, just give me the freaking template. Like you mentioned at the beginning, all of the downloads yeah. that go with the podcast episodes yeah, and the yeah. videos and stuff. Like I'm a huge believer in here's somewhere to start so that you can more quickly actually do the thing and move forward on something. Yeah. 
and we need to know where we're going. So it's really, for me, it's really both. So again, it's tell me about your day. How efficient are you throughout your day and where are you wasting time? That's really what it comes down. It's not rocket science. That's no, it's not. And I always say it's not rocket science. I would know because I was actually going to school for rocket science and it's so easy. Like we, that's the thing Like we make it so complicated. And even in the physics world, it was always fascinating to me. Everyone's ooh physics, but it's like, everything follows the same law. There is laws of physics and it's the same way every single time. There's no deviating it. There's no, no figuring out how this one's going to be different than that one because science follows very specific laws. Yeah. So it's more, it's actually less complicated than it might seem, which I feel like when things are simple, you're going to execute them more consistently when things are simple and they're easy, you're going to you're going to actually do it. If it's yeah. complicated or hard, you're never, you're never going to commit to it. Oh my gosh. This is the whole thing was gold today. This is all, this is unbelievable <sighs> nuggets. Good. Uh, I'm glad. I'm like, I have no idea where we're going with it. And we I might take a few less in there, but it's well, fine. I mean, you've laid out some good <laughs> questions and which we, I think we all, we answered all of them other yeah. than where your advisors are missing the boat. But I think the whole conversation is where the advisors are missing the boat is that they make it too complicated. They think too much. And they're just like, look, at the end of the day, figure out what way you're wasting your day on, how you can eliminate that or delegate it faster, easier, greater, <laughs> what is your, yeah. little, your little mantra. I mean, that it's incredible. I've taken enough of your time. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, how can advisors get a hold of you? What is the best way to hire you or even just talk to you or just do some research on you? What yeah. should they do? Absolutely. They can start with theefficientadvisor.com. Okay. And then we have a Facebook community. It's totally free and it's only for advisors and operations people. So we oh. screen for that. We Google you. We make sure you're actually in the business. You are not allowed to come into the group if you're just trying to like be all whatever. And it's literally like an 800 person mastermind with advisors from broker dealers, boutique firms in the U S outside of the U S and it's so cool because people will post and share and say, Hey, I'm doing this thing. Does anyone have a resource for that? It's super cool. So really? I hang out in there a lot. Yep. Love it. Every now and then I'll post like random standard operating procedures, but yeah, people are sharing, which I think is really cool. And so I hang out there and then I also hang out on LinkedIn. Okay. So, so you can find me on LinkedIn under Libby Griley. Oh my gosh. I love your LinkedIn posts. That's how I found you, by the way. Oh, um, yay. Yeah, yes. So I, so I had other wholesalers like you and I'm like, oh my gosh, who is this Libby? The efficient advisor. So we love your story. For those who are going to watch this, I highly recommend at least checking out her website. Here is Libby, you give way too much for free. Hey, so, <laughs> really <laughs> good. I know. <laughs> but I, I love it. I, you can I mean, send me a check. I'm not going to be I, mad. I will, I'll deposit it if you want me to, but, I, well, but I, that's why I love the podcast. The that, that you have on there is insane. And the podcast, the cheat sheets, it's like, you're giving it all away, which is, it's well, just, see what you get when you pay that. You no, know, that's what I'm trying to like <laughs> figure out. Like, my gosh, if she gives this all for free, what do we get when we pay? But no, it's absolutely awesome what you're doing. I, you're, you're, you're a champion for these advisors who I, they go through a lot. I, my, I don't, I can't imagine being an advisor, especially in a market like this right now and having to deal with clients and the crazy world we live in. So I commend them for what they do. And yeah, pay. I love this industry. And really my why is I saw so many amazing advisors burn out and quit Yeah, and they burned out because they felt like they were never enough. They weren't doing enough. They weren't they were working too hard. Like they just never could get to that place where it was like, oh, I was running my business and I could actually, and they were amazing advisors and they were doing the universe, a disinterest by burning out and quitting. Uh -huh. So for me, it's how do I help advisors with the stuff that maybe doesn't come naturally to them? How do I help them? Like, how do I give them the thing? Here's the template. Here's the system. Here's the thing built around what you want oh. so that you can actually stay in it and serve well. Yeah. Now, look, you have a passion for this stuff. Obviously you have a purpose to what you're doing and I commend that. And I will do whatever I can to get you out more in front of more and more advisors, because I think what you're doing is helping them enjoy life and enjoy their practice. So it's pretty cool. So thank you. My for pleasure. Being my guest today. This has been awesome. I've learned a ton. I learned my things that I never even expected from just the way you backed into things. So I, I can't thank you enough for this. So absolutely. Um, I, I, Anytime. Um, 